Hello, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Mang, and I welcome you guys to a brand new series that I'm calling the Fire Emblem Fates Beginner's Guide to Conquests. This is a concept I've wanted to do for a very long time, and the purpose of this series is to provide a video-based guide slash walkthrough for newer fans to the series. This video will be completely free of story spoilers, so the idea is that you can safely play the game alongside the chapters in this guide without any worries. While this guide is directed at newer players, it should still contain some useful hints and tips that more advanced players might find useful during their playthrough of Conquests. While Birthright takes a more casual approach by allowing the players to grind to their heart's content, Conquest is not as forgiving. In addition to limited resources, the chapters also feature more advanced objectives, and each map often throws some nasty surprises your way that can really throw you off your game. That being said, this guide is not meant to be an advanced, in-depth, turn-by-turn walkthrough to carefully guide you through the game, nor is it meant to reflect the most optimal way to play conquests. I will merely talk about the chapters, give you an idea of how to handle them, showing you what to watch out for and giving you tips on what units to bring and what weapons to field, while showing some footage of gameplay in the background. I will talk about the various playable characters that join as they appear, give you my opinions of them and whether or not they are worth the investments. This guide will only cover the main chapters of the Conquest storyline. I will not be taking into account paralogues, DLC maps or invasions. I will start the guide at chapter 7, as that is when I feel the true game begins, and I feel you should not have many issues getting past the first 6 chapters on your own if you listen carefully to the tutorial. I am going to assume that you are familiar with at least the basic Fire Emblem gameplay mechanics, but I will point out certain new features as they pop up in the game. Before we get into Chapter 7, I will take a few moments to talk about the Avatar. Regardless of how you go about creating yours, Corrin will be an extremely powerful unit, and it doesn't really matter what kind of bane, boon or talent you pick. If you do plan on reclassing your avatar to something else than a lord, I highly advise you pick a class capable of wielding swords, as Corrin gets access to a story-related unique sword that will be of some significance later on, and you might struggle a little bit in the late game without it, so do keep this in mind. If you want to know what I selected from my avatar, I decided to go with Speed as my boon and Resistance as my bane. Before going into Chapter 7, there are a few really useful things you can access via your castle base. If you go to the menu section, click your inbox and then go to Rewards. If you just picked up this game, the items here won't be available to you yet, but as people visit your castle and fight you, and you do the same to them, you will gradually unlock a lot of useful items such as weapons and stat boosters. However, if you go to Bonuses, you can get a number of useful items right away, depending on how many routes you've unlocked. These aren't super necessary, but they are useful boosters nevertheless. If you have them available, I recommend giving your Corin a pair of boots to make him more mobile. If you have enough paths unlocked to get a second pair, I recommend saving them for another character that joins a little later. The Dragon Herbs you can give to whatever unit you fancy. Alright, so we've dilly-dallied enough. Time to get into Chapter 7. At the start of the chapter, you find yourself only controlling two units, Corin and Felicia. Don't worry though, the situation may look grim, but you won't be alone for long. I can't really go into depth by talking about Corin as a unit, because you may have created a vastly different one from the one I am using, but let us start off by talking about your trusty sidekick, Felicia. Felicia is a really solid character, who you should be a little familiar with at this point, seeing as she was available in the tutorial. Being a mage, she can both heal with staves and fight with hidden weapons. She is an amazing support character, particularly for the Avatar, as her personal skill, Devoted Partner, gives the Avatar bonus damage and extra survivability. Her Demoiselle skill is also great for supporting your male units, so try to keep her centralized in your army. Being a mage, she cannot promote, but she levels all the way up to 40, so don't be afraid to use her. She cannot deal a lot of damage directly, but her hidden weapons are great for reducing the stats of powerful enemies. However, once you get your hands on some magic-dealing daggers or shurikens, Felicia can actually start dishing out a lot of damage to enemies with low resistance, seeing as her magic stat is pretty decent. Felicia is pretty squishy, so she is best kept behind your more bulky units, where she can assist with dual strikes and healing. 
Even if she does drop off towards the later points of the game, I always consider bringing Felicia if I have a slot to spare, as staves always provide fantastic utility. There are many ways to tackle this chapter, but I prefer to stay in the middle. Luckily, the Faceless don't charge you all at once, so you can tackle the groups one by one if you wish. I prefer to go after the initial pack of Faceless coming at you from the west and trying to eliminate them before the others can join the fights. My Corrin at this point doubles and one rounds them, but even if yours is not able to do this, you should be able to dispatch them easily enough with dual strikes from Felicia. On turn 2, two new allies will show up from the eastern corner of the map. They are Silas the Cavalier and Elise the Troubadour. Let's take a look at them both before continuing. Silas is your first Cavalier and he is pretty amazing. In addition to fantastic mobility and the ability to wield both swords and lances, he has really solid base stats and good growths across the board. With no real weak spots to speak of. His personal skill, WoW of Friendship, make him deal more damage and take less damage whenever your avatar is below half health. And this does not require Silas to be close to the avatar in any way. You can absolutely abuse this ability by intentionally not healing up your avatar if you know Silas is about to take on a lot of enemies. You can reclass Silas to a mercenary with a heart seal, but I honestly would not recommend it. I find the Cavalier class to be superior, as they have access to more weapons and greater mobility. Silas is just a fantastic character that will certainly not disappoint you. He will stay strong and relevant from the early game and all the way to the finish line. Definitely use him. Elise is your first mounted healer and is probably going to be one of your most useful staff users in the entire game. Like your avatar, she possesses royal blood, meaning she can activate dragon veins. While she cannot fight like Felicia in the early game, Elise enjoys greater mobility as well as a really good personal skill in Lily's Poise, which makes adjacent allies take less and deal more damage. This, combined with her Demacelle, makes her extremely good at making units around her a little bit more durable. Just keep in mind that this skill doesn't stack with itself, so you can't use Elise in combination with Felicia to double its effects. One big issue with Elise is that she is absolutely made of tin foil paper, and you will come to realize that most enemies will start one-shotting her very early on. You could solve this by giving her an angelic robe, but since she is not a combat unit, you would do well just to keep her outside of enemy range. Elise comes with a free staff, which is a very useful tool that can prevent an enemy from moving for a single turn and also slightly reduce its avoidance. Don't be afraid to use this staff to save yourself a painful restart if you notice a tough enemy within range of one of your weaker units. You will get a lot more of them. While Elise remains a cute, defenseless little healer for many chapters to come, once she promotes, she will become an absolute nuclear warhead, as her magic and speed are both incredibly high. Don't be surprised if she is able to one-round kill promoted enemies with a basic fire tome. Just make sure they cannot retaliate, because if they do, she will most likely melt. Elise is an amazing unit, and you would do well to bring her along for every chapter. If nothing else, then but for healing and popping dragon veins. I prefer to let Silas tank the southern choke point, with Elise backing him up with Demacelle. If Corrin is for whatever reason below half health, you could consider not healing him to give Silas extra damage and survivability thanks to his WoW of friendship. Let Silas tank the choke point, while Corrin and Felicia finish up any stragglers on the west side. On turn 3, two new allies will show up from the same corner. This time, we're getting an armor knight and a fighter. Let's take a look at the glorious tag team of Arthur and Effie. Arthur is a fun and interesting character. His gimmick is that his luck is awful. And this is reflected by his horrible base luck of 1 with a measly 10% growth. This means that Arthur is prone to getting criticals in the face, and this is further amplified by his personal skill, Misfortunate, which lowers his pathetic critical avoid even further, but also causes his horrible luck to affect nearby enemies as well, making them more likely to take critical hits. Despite Arthur's low luck, however, his other stats are extremely solid, and his growths are also very decent. Luck, point by point, is by far the weakest stat in Fire Emblem, and Fates is no exception, so having a character with low luck actually isn't as bad as it might sound. Sure, he might suffer the occasional unexpected crit to the face, but in my experience, he is also usually bulky enough to survive it. Arthur is the sort of character that can either become absolutely amazing or extremely bad, depending on your RNG. There usually doesn't seem to be a middle ground for the guy. 
I personally think that Arthur is amazing, but I might be slightly biased as my first one turned into an absolute meat grinder. Still, he is your only axe user so far and that will come in handy in the maps to come, so if you plan on benching him, at least bring him along for the early game because he will be useful. Effie is an absolute beast of a unit. Armor Knights have a notorious habit of being horribly bad in Fire Emblem, but Fates have changed all of that. Since your units on average are a lot more squishy in Fates compared to the earlier games, and the fact that enemies frequently use dual strikes against you now, you really need some bulky units capable of taking a lot of punishment on enemy face, and Effie is just the unit you need. With a beastly strength and defense growth, Effie will not only act as a roadblock for physical attackers, but she will also hit back incredibly hard to anyone stupid enough to get in her face. To add to her already impressive damage output, her personal skill, Poussance, gives her plus 3 damage whenever she has 5 points of strength over her opponent, which will be nearly always. Effie may not double as frequently as your other units, but since she does a lot of damage in a single strike, she is extremely good at lending powerful dual strikes. Once she gets her hands on the Beast Killer spare, she can literally one-shot most enemy cavalry she encounters. Effie is not without her weaknesses, however. Even though she is bulky, her hit points and resistance aren't all that amazing, and she will therefore get absolutely roasted by enemy magic users or effective weapons such as hammers and armor slayers. Fates have been generous enough to mark such enemies with an exclamation mark whenever you select a unit that is weak towards such weapons, so as long as you keep an eye out, you should be fine. Effie's speed growth is surprisingly decent for an armor knight, but her shitty base speed will ensure that she gets doubled a lot by faster enemies. Luckily, generals get a special skill in fates that prevents any enemies from doubling them, so don't worry too much about it. All things considered, I value Effie as one of the most useful characters in conquests. She does exactly what you need her to, and a little extra. Definitely use her. With all of the characters finally on your team, the real challenge finally begins, and the remaining faceless will start charging you in larger numbers. I prefer to keep Silas right where he is, and move Arthur and Effie up to the northern choke points. Beware though, at this point you will start to run into enemies with a very nasty skill, Poison Strike. This skill takes away 20% of a unit's total hit points whenever a unit with it initiates combat. This damage is applied after the unit attacks, and it cannot kill, only leave a unit at one health, so it's not dangerous on its own, unless there are other enemies also in range. This skill does mean, however, that regardless of how much defense a unit has, it will slowly take damage bit by bit. It is worth noting that if you kill a unit immediately, Poison Strike will not activate. As you may just have seen, you will also notice that the enemy is also pairing up. Paired up enemies are considerably harder to take down, and they also benefit from the shield bar filling up, and will block attacks just like your own units. Also, always remember to check the skills and inventory of the unit backing up the main unit, as Fates sometimes hides nasty surprises for you that way. At this point, I have Arthur, Effie, and Felicia continue to tank the northern choke points, deal with the Faceless from the north, and send Corin or Silas, or both, to deal with some stragglers coming from the west side. Just leave your units within their attack range and counter-attack them. They should go down very quickly. If needed, Felicia can come and help out with her hidden weapons. The boss will start charging you at this point, but he will take a few turns to reach you. The remaining Faceless will charge along with him, and I highly recommend dealing with them before taking on the boss, as he has a very nasty skill called Savage Blow. Savage Blow is Poison Strike, but on steroids. Instead of just affecting one unit, it affects all units within two tiles, so surrounding any unit with this skill is a very bad idea. I highly recommend you choke the southern point in preparation for the boss, but be wary. I attacked the faceless charging with the boss, and Corin took quite a lot of damage, but luckily I had Silas there to shield him. Thanks to his wild friendship activated from Corin being wounded, Silas received a massive damage and defense boosts. The boss is pretty tough, and you can see how dangerous Savage Blow can be, but with the remaining faceless dealt with, I could simply rush him down. Just make sure you fight this guy in a choke point, because out in the open he will absolutely demolish your units.
And with that, I managed to land the killing blow on the boss and clear chapter 7 in 10 turns. Join me next time as we continue onward to chapter 8. If you found this guide helpful, consider leaving a like and a comment on the video. At any rate, my name is Min Mangs, and I'll see you guys next time.